More than 70 years ago, Germany produced some of the best studio microphones in history, which are still considered industry standards to this day. But how did they do it? Were the Nazis really behind it? And if those studio mics were so extraordinary, how about the home recording type? In this video, we're going to find out. Let's jump into it. Every kind of electronic device has a set of characteristics that made them unique. In the fascinating world of microphones, one of those distinctive properties is longevity. Unlike other technological gadgets that are negatively affected by wear and tear, if microphones are well stored and handled with care, they can last for decades. Recording studios are still using models that are close from being one century old, and many of them even today are considered by music industry professionals as the holy grails of vocal production. There are two things those iconic microphones have in common. One is that they were designed and released during the 50s and 60s, and second is that a big percentage of the companies that produced them were from Germany. However, those microphones are worth thousands of dollars and have a very specific use in a much controlled environment. Having that in mind, I wondered, if vintage studio mics have such reputation, could a consumer-grade German microphone from those days be exceptional as well? After a long research online, I realized that there was barely any information about home recording German mics from the same years when Neumann, AKG and Telefunken were producing those now legendary large diaphragm condensers. So I decided to go on a quest and try to find a consumer-grade German mic from the 60s, so we can compare it to modern alternatives and see if their sonic capabilities are up to par. Before we start, I want to make clear that I only use microphones to record voiceovers and dialogue, so this video will be focused on that sort of implementation. Ok, so my first stop was to narrow down my search to one of those iconic German brands from after the Second World War. It was important for it to have produced a wide variety of devices that could also be easily found on my local second-hand market. Lucky enough, I live in Berlin, and turns out that companies like Neumann, Bayer and Telefunken were actually founded in this same city. That was a pretty good start. After having a quick look on my local eBay, I realized that Neumann microphones are not selling for less than 250 euros, and that the listing from Bayer are quite rare and definitely not cheap either. So I tried Telefunken. To my surprise, there was a beautiful and interesting looking kind of mic that kept popping up. A small dynamic microphone that was an accessory device from all reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, the Telefunken D9A. I picked one up in really good conditions that was being sold for only 10 euros by a senior citizen from Köpenick, just a few minutes away from downtown Berlin. I find the design and colors to be really charming, it is always heartwarming to see people taking such good care of their old gadgets. Considering this model is from around 1965 and still has its original box, that's more than half a century of good preservation. Very impressive. On top it has a switch, probably to turn it on and off when connected to a tape machine, and on the sides has a rag pattern that works as a grip so you can just hold it in one hand. Or you can just use the stand and leave it on the table. Quite handy. The body is made from plastic, but details like the braided cable or the little golden Telefunken plate gives it a rather premium look. They were sold for 45 Deutsche Marks, which is the equivalent to 100 euros when corrected to inflation, so they were actually not cheap. But will it sound as good as it looks? Before we dive in into the audio test and comparison, there's something very important to address. That is, its legacy 3-pin DIN connector, also called Klein Tuschel in Germany. In entertainment electronics, this 3-pin socket was used in tube radios and early mono devices in order to be able to make recordings with the emerging home tape machines from the mid-1950s. The standard was eventually replaced by American RCA connectors in the 1980s, so it cannot be plugged directly to a modern recorder. So to try this microphone, you will need to buy an XLR to 3 polygon DIN adapter, or you can make one yourself. I will leave the routing in the video description. The problem of the DIN audio connector is that the lines are not assigned in order to the direction of the signal, but rather according to the intended use, which can lead to compatibility problems in certain device combinations, as the pins are wired differently depending on the device type. So I contacted an expert in the matter, 
an adapter cable maker from Germany that has an online shop on eBay. I will also share that link. The man was really kind and gave me some great word of advice that anyone should know if they ever want to make one of these work. He said that because these type of microphones didn't have any protective mechanisms, a simple connection to a device with phantom power on, a short circuit at home, or an incorrect plug to a line level socket, and they're done for, toasted, kaput. I'm really glad I found this guy. So in the end, I got the right adapter, plug it directly to my Audient ID4 audio interface and voila, it worked! I'm going to show you the results compared to four other microphones. A Philips Dynamic Mic called MD110, which I also randomly picked up on eBay used for 10 euros. That will give us a good price to performance point of view. Then to a studio mic that's an industry standard, the Shure SM58. Third, to an Octava MK012 condenser that I use frequently on my videos and retails for 180 euros. And finally, to my Levalier mic, the Clippy EM272, which sells for 35 pounds. All the recordings will be shown with no EQ or compression. When Neumann decided not to renew his contract with Telefunken, the company joined forces with AKG and brought the legendary Elam 251 to market. When Neumann decided not to renew his contract with Telefunken, the company joined forces with AKG and brought the legendary Elam 251 to market. When Neumann decided not to renew his contract with Telefunken, the company joined forces with AKG and brought the legendary Elam 251 to market. When Neumann decided not to renew his contract with Telefunken, the company joined forces with AKG and brought the legendary Elam 251 to market. When Neumann decided not to renew his contract with Telefunken, the company joined forces with AKG and brought the legendary Elam 251 to market. And what do you think? Not so bad. I found that the Telefunken mic sounds warmer and fuller than the same budget model alternative and has way less noise floor in comparison. The other mics do sound far more crisp and clear, and there's definitely an echo to the D9A that distorts my voice. However, we have to remember that one of them was made almost 60 years ago. Plus, if we add the fact that I'm recording it digitally, rather than to an analog reel-to-reel -reel machine, it makes it even more interesting. Why? Because tape had a unique characteristic when being recorded on. It wasn't particularly sensitive in the higher frequencies, so these mics were probably designed to add a little bit of color to sound more balanced when being played on tape. Digital recording tends to be way more sensitive in the higher frequencies, but then again this is no contest. The DNA is more of a piece for a museum than a tool. Perhaps it could be useful with good equalization, or as an old school effect to a voice over or similar application. The truth is that today in 2021, we can get a great sounding mic like the Fifine 669 for only 30 euros, without caveats like the need of an adapter or the lack of a security mechanism that can toast your unit. So all things being considered, the telephone can ultimately did perform better than a randomly picked today same budget mic, but that leaves us with bigger questions. How were these German companies able to produce such remarkable pieces of technology? Was Hitler really behind this? To answer that, we'll have to go back in time. After the First World War, radio was the newest and most exciting technology, even though radio waves were first identified and studied by German physicist Heinrich Hertz in 1886, the ones leading the race of building broadcast infrastructure were the Americans and the British. But things suddenly changed in the year 1933, when the European political landscape got shaken by Adolf Hitler's rise to power. That same year, Joseph Goebbels was appointed by Hitler as the head of the newly created Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. His mission was simple, to increase popular support for the party at whatever the cost. Goebbels understood very well that to manipulate German's middle class and shape popular opinion, the Nazi party needed to centralize and control all aspects of German cultural and intellectual life. This process was called Gleichschaltung, later translated as Nazification of the State and Society. One of those key institutions was radio broadcasting. All radio stations were nationalized and supervised under the German National Broadcasting Corporation, controlled by the Propaganda Ministry. Radio manufacturers were instructed by Goebbels to produce inexpensive home receivers, and in a few years, millions of them flooded the market. Sometimes they were distributed for free to the people, in special dates like Goebbels' birthday. 
Loudspeakers were placed in public areas, factories and schools, so that important party broadcasts would be heard live by nearly all Germans. Not that the whole country could listen to them, they needed to master their recording technology so that their message could come across in the clearest possible way. Consequently, the Nazi party masterminded by Goebbels focused all their efforts and pushed the whole industry towards that ultimate goal. That was the motor that drove Germany to reach for new standards in technology. Every single company that could contribute in any way to their interests was classified by the party as important to the rearmament effort, centralized and nationalized. Another key element was that manufacturers, who previously had to outsource parts from the open market, were now intrinsically connected. Engineers from electronics giant AEG worked together with chemical producer IG Farben and the National Broadcasting Corporation to perfect a relatively new but very promising new way of recording, the magnetic tape. After years of research, engineer Walter Weber from AEG discovered a new phenomenon called AC bias. Introducing ultra-high frequencies into the record circuit gave the recording more stability and accuracy by controlling the oscillation of the magnetic field. The results? An almost flat frequency response, a dynamic range of close to 65 decibels with less than 3% distortion. It simply became the best recording technology in the world. Another very important instrument for the propaganda machine were microphones. The Neumann CMB3, also known as Hitler Bottle, was used at almost all major speeches by National Socialist ministers and politicians. At the Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936, the microphone passed its test in front of a large audience, and after the start of the war, Neumann's microphones and thus his company were classified by the Nazis as important to the war effort and given a limited discretionary budget for research and development. So if you ever wonder why some German electronics devices from after the Second World War were so perfectly designed and engineered and built with military-grade components, this might answer that question. The end was nefarious, but the products are still unmatched. I hope you enjoyed the video. Such a dark but interesting story. The Telefunken D9A might not be that impressive, but it surely opened a whole new door with many more microphones to explore in future videos. Thanks for watching. Until next time.